Good morning, um, everyone, um, and welcome. And we're happy to see you all at this, the eighth hearing of the 187th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission. And this hearing number eight um, is entitled Advances and Challenges in International Coordination and Cooperation for the Protection of the Rights of People in Human Mobility in the Region. And it was convened ex officio by the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. My name is Margaret May McCauley. I'm the president of the commission and the rapporteur for people of African descent and, for, and against racism and for the rights of older persons. With me on the panel, the commission's panel, is the second vice president, Commissioner Roberta Clark, who is the rapporteur for human mobility and for human rights defenders, uh, Commissioner Joel Hernandez, and the rapporteur for persons deprived of liberty, and Stuart um, Strado, I beg your pardon, I was saying it in English, and Strado Rallon. Um, also present at this hearing is the Executive Secretary, who I have not seen, Tanya Renault. Uh, I have seen the Deputy Executive Secretary for Monitoring, Maria Claudia Polido, and the Special Rapporteur for Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia Munoz. Um, I start with a cordial greeting from all of us in the commission to civil society here present and to the representatives of the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights for Central America and the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the Latin America and Caribbean Demographic Center. <clears throat> um, Oh, and the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, and the pro tempore chair of the Quito process. Before or we go on further, let me explain the distribution of time. It's the longest list I've had so far. Um, for civil society, five minutes per organization, which comes to a total of 25 minutes, Amnesty International, five minutes. The Caribbean Center for, of Human Rights, five minutes. The Center for Legal and Social Studies, five minutes. The Center for Justice and International Law, five minutes. HIAS, five minutes. Alberto Brunelli, I haven't seen, and anyway, um, um, of, uh, of the office of the, uh, Commissioner of Human Rights, Regional Representative for Central America and the Caribbean, five minutes. Maria Banques Del Rey, UNCHR Senior Protect Protection Coordinator, five minutes. Zuma Sosa, Population and Development Coordination, Saladi, five minutes. Ambassador Pedro uh, Hernandez, Pro Tempore Chair of the Quito Pro Process, five minutes. For the commission, the uh, commission um, panel and staff, 20 minutes. Additional comments from each, from, from participants, not each, total of seven minutes. And the closing session by the commission, three minutes. Um, the objective for those who are online witnessing and, part, and listening to the process, I'll just state what that is. The objective of the hearing is to receive information on the best practices and challenges in international coordination and co cooperation between the states of the region and other actors, such as civil society organizations, international human rights organizations, and economic and financial organization, um, uh, organizations, among others for the protection and guarantee of the rights of people in human mobility. 
In addition, this hearing is part of the existing cooperation project with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to highlight the need to give effect to the principles of shared responsibility and international cooperation based on the preparation of the sub-regional report, which will be mentioned. With that, I now give the floor to civil society. So the first speaker could start. Hola, buenos días, Presidenta Macaulay. De Hello, Nacional. good morning, President Macaulay and members of the IHCHR and Executive Secretariat. I, my name is Adeline Neo, and I'm here with Marika Prom and Belisa Guerrero from Amnesty International. In our intervention, we will refer to how the humanitarian crisis in the continent has forced thousands of people to seek international protection. The, and also the, the right to seek asylum is restricted in the continent. So in that sense, we will refer to the militarization of the borders in Chile and Peru, which has triggered a humanitarian crisis in February and the um, migration policies implemented by the United States that restrict the right to seek for asylum. First, Amnesty International uh, values the original initiatives of coordination to respond to more than 7.3 Venezuelans that are, are refugees and also the efforts of some states to provide assistance and protection despite the great challenges that that entails. However, the organization observes with much concern that in certain states in the Americas, the asylum systems are ineffective for Venezuelans. Also, the increase of stigmatizing discourses in several of the main receiving countries, such as Peru and Chile, have been accompanied with measures implemented by the administrations, including the closing and militarization of borders, on top of proposals to criminalize the irregular migration, which uh, puts at risk at risk these uh, small progress that has been made and restricts the right to asylum. So in that case, in that context, Amnesty International reports that in several countries, the unilateral measures have created a domino effect. For example, the closure and militarization of borders on in Chile from February 2023 has left dozens of people strained in precarious conditions in the border with Peru, which also uh, declared a state of emergency. So these measures not only infringe the international obligation of the states on human rights, but also ignores the dimension, the manifestation of the mobility crisis that is affecting more than 7 million refugees in the region coming from Venezuela. So this uh, worsens the protection, the, the lack of protection for those asylum seekers and those vulnerable people with a differentiated impact on women and LGBT, LGBTQ plus people. I said, I give the floor to my colleague. In relation with the United States, while the Title 42 uh, application ended on May the 11th, this year, the new migration policies continue to limit drastically the ask the right to asylum in this border. So Amnesty International observes with concern the obligatory use of an app, CVP-1, as the only means to uh, request international protection in U the United States. That restricts the, the possibilities of those who seek asylum because it's an important obstacle for people who do not have access to cell phones nor the internet or who cannot access the app or know how to use it. That app should never be the only way of requesting asylum in the United States. Also, the application has have failed several times, forcing asylum seekers to wait in Mexico um, for long periods where they uh, are at risk of suffering violence and there are no minimum uh, conditions 
guaranteed. Also, CP, CVP-1 is um, concerning in terms of security. Amnesty International is concerned that the technologies of facial recognition and GPS, alongside with the cloud and um, managing, becomes an obstacle and that facial recognition technology is used uh, in the discriminatory way. I give the floor to Belisa Guerrero. Thank you very much. Uh, we will leave our intervention here because we do not have enough time and we will uh, continue commenting uh, this in the uh, next seven minutes after these other interventions. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm not I, I suppose to continue now. Bonjour, okay. je pense que je peux continuer maintenant. Okay, good morning everyone. Bonjour à tous. Um, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to provide the Caribbean Center for Human Rights to present our issues and concerns on uh, uh, the, the progress and challenges with regards to uh, persons and mobility. Uh, um, I wanted to focus this presentation uh, specifically on the issue here in Trinidad and Tobago simply because we have a number uh, of challenges in uh, uh, meeting the protection needs of, of uh, refugees and migrants in Trinidad and Tobago. And just for context, Trinidad and Tobago is a part of the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1951. Trinidad and Tobago established a draft national policy to address refugee and asylum matters in 2014, but that has not been integrated into local legislation. Currently, arrivals of migrants and refugees are treated under the 1976 Immigration Act, which lacks provision to deal with asylum seekers and refugees. In the absence of the Domestic legislation and the United High Commission, United Nations High Commission for Refugees undertakes registration and refugee status determination. Trinidad and Tobago hosts asylum seekers for over 35 countries. Trinidad has experienced an influx of migrants and refugees as a consequence of the humanitarian and human rights crisis in neighboring Venezuela. Given the lack of a domestic policy, Trinidad and Tobago faces a number of challenges in responsibly and effectively managing the influx. And this has come as a consequence of not having um, local legislation or any sort of legal framework to guide the response and the influx. We've had a host of human rights violations. Trinidad and Tobago is not a member of any regional or international coordination mechanism. Trinidad and Tobago, as you would know, did not join the uh, Los Angeles Declaration of the Summit of the Americas last year. The only regional or international mechanism that supports this influx is via the Response for Venezuelans platform, which remains underfunded. Resources to this region pales in comparison to funds directed to other crises around the world, for example, the Syrian crisis and the Ukraine crisis even though the Venezuelan crisis is of a similar scale in terms of the numbers and the protection needs. As a consequence of um, this influx, we've had uh, human rights viol violations with regards to human trafficking. The scale of human trafficking in Trinidad and Tobago um, is, is extremely, you know, uh, a very huge crisis in relation to, to Trinidad and Tobago being as small as it is. Um, the vulnerabilities as a consequence of the crisis has contributed to a thriving trafficking, smuggling situation in Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago remains on the watch list of the United States the State Department's Trafficking in Persons report. Uh, Trinidad has been the recipient of funds to tackle this issue. However, we have had no convictions since trafficking legislation was established in 2011. CCHR recently brought to light allegations of sexual abuse by Coast Guard at an immigration station that was set up as a COVID response mechanism. We have serious concerns with the operation of this facility. Nous avons des préoccupations avec cette situation. A recent the High Court ruling um, has ruled that anyone found to have entered the country illegally 
de personnes qui ont des conventions va en contre de la convention de la convention One thing that is likely to change in 2023 is that most refugees and displaced persons stay as close to their countries as possible. Therefore, Trinidad and Tobago will continue to drop, grapple with this influx as long as, as the situation in Venezuela persists, and we will continue to see the violation of human rights if significant changes in the current response does not occur. Our proximity to Venezuela and that we are an English-speaking country, and the fact that we are a very small country presents a host of issues for the protection and integration of migrants and refugees. TCHR has appealed to the government of Trinidad and Tobago and to Car CARICOM to consider responsibility sharing mechanisms. It is apparent that Trinidad and Tobago cannot bear this burden alone, and other countries in the region should step up to assist. I would be happy to answer more questions and talk a bit more about the human rights violations uh, later in, um, in the next session. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Lucía Galopo de Cares. Me acompañan Mabel Cobos del Observatorio Ciudadano y Gabriela Oviedo de CEGIL. I'm with Gabriela from CEGIL. We are conducting this intervention on behalf of CAREF. Observatorio Ciudadano, the National Network of Migrants from Chile and Zahib. In the last decade, there were new fora and political spaces to discuss migration as it happened with the uh, declaration in Brazil, the world uh, situation, the declaration of Los Angeles, and the migration summit for Latam and Caribbean. This uh, together with what already existed, the regional conference, among others. The multiplication of intergovernmental uh, fora for cooperation and other participation mechanisms generated a situation in the multilateral fora. Furthermore, the atomization of responses in these uh, areas and the lack of coordination did not help. The lack of a coordinated migration policy gives way to growth of a regressive model spread throughout the region. In order to contain migration, the states throughout Central and South America apply security and control policies and measures to the detriment of the expansion and flexibility of regular, permanent, and accessible channels. Under this logic, expulsions, border rejections, militarization, and externalization of borders, criminalization of the migrant and refugee population, and the progressive limitation of access to asylum are carried out. We observe that two models of migration management coexist in the continent. One emerged at the beginning of the century within Mercosur, based on integration, free circulation, and multilateral cooperation, and the other already mentioned with a focus on controlling and hindering migration based on asymmetrical and opaque bilateral agreements. Particularly in South America, we have been documenting the progressive abandonment of the integration model and its replacement by migration control policies. This translates into measures that limit access to the rights of migrants in an irregular situation, administrative sanctions for entry through unauthorized crossings, even in the context of pandemic, the prioritization of re-entry expulsions and the militarization of borders as recurrent practices in Chile, Peru and Bolivia. In addition to this, the imposition of visas in a discriminatory manner and the creation of temporary regularization programs that ignore the intention of integration of people in a situation of human mobility. At the same time, regressive legislative reforms are advancing, such as the proposed migration policy in Chile, where an emphasis on security and border control, the criminalization of irregular migration, and the limitation of available regularization channels are identified. In addition to this panorama of fragmentation and the marked advance of regressive policies, it is worth highlighting the way in which these policies and measures are agreed upon and implemented. They are generally bilateral, sorry, bilateral and sometimes trilateral cooperation agreements between the U.S. government and countries in the region, with practically no transparency about their existence, content and implementation, and much less participation of the people impacted. 
The same has been translated to the processes of construction of national migration policies in Central America, where certain UN agencies have initiated and constructed policies without the real participation and accompaniment of civil society, or have implemented actions in conjunction with the state without observing international human rights standards. We follow what Lucia is saying. The Los Angeles Declaration of subsequent bilateral agreements have brought with them new improvised and ineffective state practices, such as the failed implementation in three countries of migration processing centers called secure mobility offices, which have been characterized by a lack of clear and accurate information and the continuous collapse of their services. In addition, it is not clear that the procedures established warranty due process in the face of a request for international uh, protection. They is also concerned about the promotion of unclear and temporary labor migration spaces, which in cases such as in the H2A and H2B visas uh, for temporary agricultural work have given way to cases of labor exploitation. In the sense, although the creation of complementary channels such as family reunification programs, parole, labor channels, among others, is positive, these do not necessarily respond in time, form, or respect for the fundamental rights of persons in need of international protection, for which access to territory and territorial asylum procedures is fundamental. We call for the recovery and reformation of existing standards, good practices, and mechanisms for dialogue and coordination. Regardless of the main multilateral coordination space or spaces, a series of minimum characteristics must be respected to ensure, on the one hand, the substantive participation participation of people in human mobility, civil society organizations, international organizations and other counterparts through broad institutional and permanent mechanisms. On the other hand, the transparency of the content and implementation of the discussions and decisions taken there should be warranted. In our experience, we have observed that the firms most likely to warranty broad participation and transparency tend to be those with more horizontal and democratic relations between states that have their own secretariat and funding to ensure adequate follow-up and that have clear rules of procedure, participation, and agreement making. Finally, we urge states and international organizations to maintain a human rights perspective as an indispensable guiding principle in the discussion, design, and implementation of policies related to people in mobility throughout the region. Faced with this scenario, it is also urgent to reaffirm the content and relevance of international standards on the matter. Over the last decades, this Honorable Commission has had the opportunity to examine the obligations regarding access to international protection and non refoulement in the face of bilateral safe third country agreements. These standards, together with the Inter-American prin uh, Principles of Human Mobility, constitute a clear guideline that does not admit regression and must be observed when international cooperation agreements are made to respond to migratory flows in the region. In addition, the current approach of international cooperation to human mobility in the region reveals two clear and neglected problems. First, cooperation agreements have allowed the implementation of the use of surveillance technologies in migration control without transparency, accountability or prior control of the necessity, proportionality and legality of their use, such as the use of biometric data. As long as there are no clear regulations, states should refrain from using these technologies. Second, international cooperation and coordination has not addressed the structural causes of human mobility and promotes a regional policy of criminalization rather than attention. The focus of a strategy to address the root causes of mobility cannot be limited to the creation of economic opportunities. It is also necessary to address the crisis of democracy, corruption, and violence that cause hundreds of thousands of people to flee their countries each year in our region, as well as other structural causes of mobility, such as climate displacement. Good morning, everyone. Therefore, we request one, prepare a communique calling on the states to warranty the transparency of processes and agreements, the participation of people in human mobility and civil society, as well as accountability in the various spaces and processes of international coordination and cooperation on migration issues in our region. 
to, to follow up on the compliance of states with international standards, monitoring with special attention the new migration measures issued by the different states in recent years without the framework of the sorry, within the framework of the various intergovernmental forum, as well as the measures determined unilaterally. In addition to follow up in particular on measures that physically and or legally hinder access to asylum, recalling the standards established in this regard. Third, urge the states to respect their commitments assumed in the obligations regarding the right to asylum, refraining from measures that limit or restrict the exercise of this right, considering the provisions of the 51st Convention, as well as those defined by the Cartagena Declaration, an essential instrument for the reality of forced human mobility in our region. Fourth, monitor the implementation of the Los Angeles Declaration under the leadership of the Rapporteur of the Rights of Migrants. For this, it is crucial to actively engage with the states that have signed the declaration, emphasizing the importance of an approach based on human rights and respectful of inter-American human rights standards. Five, we request the IACHR to prepare a regional report focused on human rights violations occurring at international borders, also identifying patterns of racial discrimination linked to such violations. Any other questions will be at your disposal. Thank you very much. Madam President, in on uh, behalf of HIAS, we would like to mention three critical aspects related to the main aspect of this audience. First and foremost, it is of the utmost importance to highlight the situation in the region, and they have faced practical difficulties in spite of their importance for the emergent uh, countries. Uh, but these uh, independent reports highlighted the situation and they gain prominence since 2018, especially in regards uh, of the crisis of displacement. The fragility of these mechanisms increased in the region due to the change in the governments. There's also a predominant focus from the governments that could not uh, indicate their capacity to uh, tackle these problems. In countries such as Colombia, there are two coexisting mechanisms that show the insufficiency in operative terms, and they have a fragmented coordination in the terrain. This obstaculizes the activities, but they don't provide the necessary resources. Furthermore, Hayes identified several obstacles that the social, uh, the, the civil society faces. These challenges include some coordination mechanisms that don't have a real governance mechanism, especially at the local level. This is due to the fact that there's a lack of resources and support for these uh, organizations, the prominence of the UN voice and other coordination mechanisms could generate a uh, power imbalance uh, without considering the civil society voices. This could uh, result in the exclusion of their own decisions and the lack of possibilities of uh, taking their own, making their own decisions. The uh, civil society and their capacity to make decisions varies considerably among the different governments. This has to do with uh, politics and with different uh, points of view. And second, secondly, I would like to reflect upon the Los Angeles Declaration signed by more than 20 governments. When uh, regressive migrant policies arise, including uh, this title and the policy in the US, we observed the following. The opening of uh, safe mobility in Colombia and Costa Rica and how this is uh, taking place and how this could improve in the violation of rights. Although we acknowledge the importance of this declaration as a vital framework, 
it is not clear how it is being implemented and the role it has. Third, I would like to highlight that during this uh, panorama, the region is facing a financial crisis. We need the support of the international uh, community, which was not su uh, sufficient. This situation is especially critical in Venezuela, where the lack of financing uh, caused the reduction of medical attention, food, and in the north of uh, Central America, uh, they had obstacles to tackle uh, poverty, violence, and the impact of climate change. Currently, there are seven uh, humanitarian response plans in the region, but this was very low in 2022. The average was 24%, and this year, 40%, 14%, showing that's the lowest level compared to all the regions in the world. Well, I would like to post the following recommendations to monitor the implementation of the Los Angeles Declaration under the leadership of the Special Rapporteur. It's crucial to engage with the states that have signed the declaration um, with a focus on human rights to promote the participation of civil society with the existing mechanisms in, their, in the region, especially those led by the states, also to draft a regional report focused on uh, human rights violations in the international borders by in situ monitoring. This report is crucial with a view of the regressive policies arising in the region. Also, this report could be uh, conducted with human rights organizations of the UN. In conclusion, it's fundamental to address these, to, to strengthen the existing mechanisms, to promote the effective participation of civil society, and to ensure adequate funding to guarantee the protection of the displaced in our region. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, before I move on to our next group of speakers, let me just ask all of you who've presented up to now to please send us copies of your presentations to the Secretariat. We'll be most grateful for, for that. Um, I now um, invite um, the start of the from the international hu human rights organizations who are here present. And I call on Ms. Senor Alberto Brunori, who is an old friend. Um, to make his presentation in five minutes. Could you please keep your eye on the clock as you speak? The last speaker went over time. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Margaret. I'm uh, nice to see you. Buenos dias, agradezco la comisión y todo. Good morning. Thank you to the commission and all the people here. I'm here in my role as regional representative for Central America and the Caribbean to provide information with uh, informal information without being under oath. None of my comments will be understood as this implicit uh, denouncement of the privileges of the United Nations and by virtue of the Convention of 1946. The human rights universal and inter-American uh, protection systems establish minimum criteria that the states must uh, apply to protect human rights of migrants. It's important to have interstate and international cooperation. In the Americas, there have been important efforts to incorporate a human rights approach into the regulatory frameworks for migration and refugees. For example, to ensure the non-criminalization of migration for most in most of the legislations of the countries, acknowledging the right to health, education, work, etc. Despite the progress, the migrants and the refugees still face challenges. Due to the lack of a comprehensive response and restrictive migration policies, in some countries, borders have become militarized. On the other hand, there are different administra administration policies that intend to limit the access to rights and national protection mechanisms due to the migration status of the people. Also, 
there has been violence and violation of human rights for migrate from people in a migration status. Migrants are also facing a uh, forced refoulement and the uh, suspension of the guarantees of due process and the uh, are not protected by the best uh, principles, the best practices for uh, children's rights. So it's crucial to establish channels to, for achieving regular migration and the broadening of these systems to assist the mixed migration influxes. Also taking into account the situation of human mobility of peoples from Nicaragua and, and Venezuela. States must strengthen international regional cooperation to save lives and to look for disappeared uh, migrants with the participation of next of kin national human rights organizations civil society organizations as it was uh, requested here and other stakeholders access to justice continues to be a challenge as well it's necessary to strengthen the uh, instances of justice um, provision in technical terms as well. Also, victims should uh, provide testimony without being forced to stay in a foreign country to guarantee that they can report the abuses without fear of, of being detained. We have to ensure the access to um, language interpretation to gather information on uh, abuses to get to sentences. The creation of the support and research uh, mechanism uh, for looking for disappeared people in Mexico and also the mechanism in El Salvador are uh, important and positive advancements and these must be strengthened with the cooperation of countries in the country. Lastly, no state can uh, address this on their own. So shared responsibility and it has been um, supported by many countries have to result in a cooperation of migrants and government organizations and civil society organizations to continue strengthening national protection mechanisms on the basis of international human rights obligations in a solidarity way. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Commissioners and Executive Secretary. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. From the UNHCR, we want to point to the complexity in the region where there is forced uh, Human mobility, forced displacement in human mobility without precedent. In 2022, at the end, we had 108.4 million people who had been displaced, and 21.8 million are found in the Americas. So countries continue to receive most of the displaced persons in the continent. There are three countries in the Americas that are within the five uh, countries that are that have the most um, uh, requests, which is the United States, Costa Rica, and Mexico. There are many complexities in the region where we see internal displacement, uh, victims of human trafficking, uh, children on their own, they are requesting uh, um, asylum, but there are there is no accessibility and there are no opportunities for stability. And this forces people to uh, resort to violence and, and they face violence, exploitation, xenophobia, statelessness, limitation to access to territory, to asylum. And also we have observed that there is a, an additional pressure on national protection systems and asylum systems as 
for uh, uh, local authorities. So what can we do about this? There is a multi causal uh, nature to this. People move for different reasons using the same uh, channels in an irregular way. However, these structural uh, reasons such as violence, persecution, poverty, inequality, human rights abuses, or uh, climate change are crucial to understand and to predict the movements that exist within the Americas. But, however, there are some progress. There have been some progress in terms of uh, legal frameworks, for example, innovative systems in terms of regularization and incorporation of migrants and, and uh, asylum seekers. Also, the decentralization and digitalization of asylum systems and the importance of the uh, foster organizations. However, we have observed as well that there are still some challenges. So what can we do? We request a cooperative uh, approach. We have seen that uh, countries cannot be acting in an isolated manner. We need the, the collectivity approach. And this has to be based on the principles of cooperation, solidarity, and shared responsibility. Likewise, we need for there to be a joint action to address the reasons behind the displacement, mitigation of risks, and also the protection of affected people with this human rights approach to avoid uh, this becoming uh, normal. So we need a comprehensive approach to include the differentiated needs of the different people uh, people involved in these movements. And for that, we have to see how we can uh, act on this. In this case, strengthening the mechanisms such as the Global Pact of, of Refugees and Global Pact of Migrants, and also the regional mechanisms of coordination continue to be essential to move forward jointly to alleviate the pressure on migration systems and to prom promote stability. The region has seen how that uh, in strategic uh, approach can be useful as well as shared responsibility and, and resource mobility are essential. For example, the MISC, which is the regional implementation of the Global Pact of Migrants, the process of Quito, who is here as well, the Los Angeles Declaration, which can become a comprehensive framework. However, that incorporation of regional protection mechanisms require other regional processes, for example, migration governance, such as regional conferences on migration, and other regional systems such as SICA, MERCOSUR, or CARICOM. However, what is important is the work of the OAS and the Commission with their inter-American principles on um, human mobility are also essential. So we have two opportunities before us, which are the World Forum on Refugees in December, which can be an opportunity to reaffirm the commitments of the Global Pact of Refugees and also to have new commitments and to make visible what is happening in the region the 40th anniversary of Cartagena next year, and the uh, Brazil Pact, which can result in a roadmap for the next 10 years. So to conclude, we have to work together to promote safe mobility and to promote access to effective protection and sustainable solutions to include all stakeholders, development sectors, financial, international, and regional organizations, international community, the foster communities, and the displaced people, and regional uh, organizations and, re and processes, and civil societies. With this, I conclude uh, the UNHCR is committed to join efforts to cooperate with you so that all displacement, so, so that we can promote 
sustainable and durable solutions and to protect the persons uh, who are in this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, um, Ambas Ambassador Pedro Hernandez, please, could you make your submissions and could you keep within the allotted time? Thank you. Good morning. As pro tempore president of the Quito process, I will focus on human rights approaches. And we can point to the fact that the Quito process is the intergovernmental space that seeks to develop process proposals to exchange best practices and to follow up on shared problems to develop an articulated response in the face of uh, human mobility in the region. We are seeking for a safe and regular mobility of refugees and migrants of the different countries of Latin America and other parts of the world. We also seek to enforce the process of Quito as a technical space for regional coordination with a focus on democratization of the process, fostering the formal incorporation of actors or players from the civil society uh, with regional steps in order to gather efforts to build a new migration uh, framework that it's very important to us and we need to highlight the contribution of human mobility to sustainable development of the destination countries shared in the information integration protection of human rights and the inclusion of the uh, communities that uh, receive these migrants in order to provide uh, a response to the situation. Therefore, during the pro tempore presidents of Chile in the process of Quito, this will be sustained in the following principles, solidarity, international solidarity, strengthening of the regional and international cooperation, defense, protection and promotion of human rights, shared responsibility, and the consolidation of multilateralism. Furthermore, we have to stress that different uh, action dimensions were taken into account in the uh, Quito process. One of those is the sustainable development in different communities, uh, migration regularity and regime of permanence and residence, a focus of protection and access to rights the international cooperation and regional cooperation for the system of Quito process and their member countries. As uh, regards the migration regularity and the permanence, regularity is vital to achieve a sustainable integration uh, process. Furthermore, we need to highlight that this uh, dimension should contribute to a humane agenda, uh, which is safe for human mobility in a region, and it has to be uh, done in a coordinated way in order to respect human rights. The focus of protection and access to human rights seeks to respect and make effective human rights, uh, social and the vital, uh, the fundamental freedoms of people in human mobility. We should all highlight that we are working in order to intensify the regional coordination in human rights for migrants. In 
in terms of the militarization of the macro north area in Chile, the, up, the goal is to share the human trafficking bans, prioritizing the access through uh, enabled areas. In fact, in this moment, uh, different authorities of our country are working in the north with the uh, authorities of Bolivia. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, um, Mr. Ambassador, and uh, staying within time. I now happily call on Salade, this is representative Manzuma Sosa, to make her presentation in five minutes. Thank you. Zulma. Hello. Thank you, Margaret. Sí. Sí, sí. Aquí estoy. Muy buenos días. ¿Me escuchan? Yes, yes, here I am. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yes. Gracias. Bueno, agradezco la... Okay, I really thank you for the invitation to participate in this event and I extend the greetings from the Salade uh, Director Simone Chekin for ECLAC. It is vital to foster uh, public policies uh, based in intelligence, focus on human rights and putting people at the center of this framework. And as regards migrants, it is vital to generate the connections so that they can contribute with their capacities and their full potential to the development of the receiving countries, ensuring their safety, dignity and respect of their rights during the whole migration process. In this framework, uh, ECLAC accompanies uh, the region during the debates, contributing to the incorporation of goals related to migration in the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development and the adoption of the World Pact for Safe Migration that acknowledges the importance of the region in migration and the necessity of cooperation. Furthermore, it co-leads the process of uh, follow-up of the, impl the regional implementation of the pact throughout the regional network of migration. In this framework, it was created the first regional uh, report and we participated in the forum of uh, co international cooperation in 2022 on behalf of the rest regional commissions of the UN. To follow up this, uh, in FEMI, the regional network organizes for next August 8th, the first conversational of mechanism of dialogue, the permanent dialogue of the civil society with LATAM and Caribbean governments to reflect upon the implementation of the World Pact and the recommendations from FEMI crystallized in this uh, declaration. Also, a CLAC co-leads with ACNUR uh, and UNICEF, sorry, with the UNHCR and UNICEF with the different agencies of the system in order to provide technical assistance to the teams of the UN in the countries and to the uh, coordinators in order to tackle these challenges in the region. Furthermore, at the regional level, the Technical Secretariat for the Regional Conference on Population and Development, ECLAC, promotes the implementation and follow-up of the priorities, the Chapter F of the Consensus of Montevideo of 2013 about international migration and the protection of the human rights of all the migrants. Uh, they also participate as an observer from their uh, foundation in the sub-regional intergovernmental forum, the CRM and the South American Conference for Migrations, CSM, contributing technically and sharing good practices to achieve a better management of migration. In spite of the advances, the international community continues to be behind in terms of the responses of these challenges. One of the difficulties has to do with the lack of updated data, not sync 
and available about international migration. In this sense, ECLAC is promoting the generation of evidence that sustains a narrative and an affirmative focus to eliminate prejudice and to facilitate and promote contribution of migration to sustainable development as long as sorry as well as the design of more inclusive uh, public policies for a migrant uh, uh, management. In the last uh, two years, ECLAC realized evidence about the situation of migrant people and their contribution to sustainable development and the dynamic in the demographics in context of fast uh, aging in terms also of the enrichment of culture. However, with all the contributions that people, migrant people do to the development of their receiving countries, there are great challenges for governability and for the protection of their rights, the migrant irregularity, the work informality and discrimination, violence, exploitation and xenophobia that are present in the region, perpetrate the vulnerability conditions and difficult the social inclusion of migrants. In this context, our message from ECLAC is it's time to change perspective and the public consensus about migrant uh, based on the situation with an intercultural uh, 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 overview based on human rights, tolerance, and accepting uh, migration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so very much. We'll now come to the Inter-American Commission itself and uh, members of the panel. And I invite, uh, we are to have 20 minutes, but we have trespassed on that. So I, with the acquiescence of my colleagues, I ask that we try to do it in 15 minutes if we can. And so I invite the, the second vice president, Roberta Clark to, uh, comment. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Just a brief comment because I would like to leave time for the rapporteur, um, who, uh, Commissioner Hernandez, who deals with uh, human yeah. mobility. But I think, of course, it's such a conundrum. As we all speak in, I think we all understand the complexity that we are that we are confronting. One of you, I, I believe it was Maria. You spoke about the 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 without precedent levels of forced displacement and human mobility, and, and that is exactly right. Of course, sort of the, the, the technology of now, the transportation of now makes that possible, but there are deep structural reasons, the democracy crises in several of our countries, poverty, unemployment, corruption, insecurity, violence, and increasingly climate change impacts as people have to, to leave to get to safety. Um, so these are, in fact, um, global political economy issues, and the solutions lie in that relationship. Those, uh, well, the causation lies in that asymmetrical power relationship that you all spoke about in relation to how countries relate to each other, um, certainly in this region and, and everywhere. So we know that the solution, or we get come closer to the solution of the structural issues through multilateralism and through a commitment to equality within countries and between countries. Uh, and I think that that is the political challenge of this uh, migration issue. Um, they are, I mean, countries do have real uh, issues in containing or responding to that in what you call the influx of persons, but we seek to get them to, to address those challenges with their best humanity, understanding these are humanitarian crises. So I just really want to acknowledge what I've heard you all say and acknowledge the dilemma that it is. And that um, I think many of the recommendations that you have made here, I think are recommendations of the commission should follow up. If there's any time, I would like to ask the representative from the Caribbean Center for Human Rights to speak a little bit more to the concrete human rights challenges beyond human trafficking that she's observing in the country that she's speaking from. But if there's time for that, thank you very much. 
um, um, Commissioner thank you. If there's, if there's no time, perhaps she can submit something in writing. Um, I now invite my brother, Commissioner uh, Joel Hernandez, who is the Rapporteur for Persons in Mobility, to intervene. Gracias, gracias, Presidenta. Saludo con mucho afecto a las personas participantes. Thank you very much, Madam uh, President. Thank you very much to the civil society organizations for making this possible, which was extremely um, important also to listen to the representations of the international organizations that work in, in this uh, migration topics. We are facing a dilemma, as our colleague uh, Roberta Clark was saying in the region, we observe uh, migration movement unprecedented uh, through uh, several years. I won't repeat here the diagnosis that was correctly made by you, but of course I'd like to highlight the, the dimension of this problem. And as uh, the, it was said before, no state can tackle this issue alone. And I believe that we need to highlight the strength that was done to contain the different migration uh, flows we have the presence of Ambassador Pedro Hernandez from the process of Quito. Uh, the process of Quito, they precisely helped with the flow of migration from Venezuela. We must say that that influx has overflown most countries. It continues to overflow them with an influx that we don't actually see in its real uh, magnitude. I would like to point three things here. First, the progress, then the challenges, and third, what the Commission can do about this. I think it's truly important to see the progress that was achieved to establish the principles of governance of migration ever since the Global Pact of Migration, the Global Pact of Refugees, and most recently, the importance of the Los Angeles Declaration as well as as it as it is the most recent politic uh, expression of, in this matter. Also, there is institutionality that is following up on the commitments of these agreements, MIRPS, the Regional Conference of Migration, the South American Conference, as it was mentioned here before. But also, I think it's important to underscore the development of the international law on human rights, what I, which I think is quite consolidated at the moment. It's undoubtedly very much relevant at the moment. However, there are still some challenges as you have very well put it. And one of them was, which is very important, Sulma Sosa said this of ICLAC, we have to start by changing the narrative so that there is at state level, but also within the states, a full recognition of what of the contributions made by migrants to economic development. Also, it's important to address the root causes of migration. The root causes, as Mabel Covo said, are not necessarily uh, isolated. They have to be considered uh, jointly. I want to highlight here this acknowledgement by 20 countries of the region in the Los Angeles Declaration where they precisely address the importance of addressing the rooted causes of migration. As the declaration reads, migration must be, in the end, a free and informed decision and not a forced decision. The other challenge that we face is, as Maria Vances said, uh, we have to move towards a regional, coordinated, and co collaborative approach. It's only possible to address migration in our region if it's done with a shared responsibility approach, but a differential approach as well, because when we see how in this enormous chain, 
the countries taking into account their own national interests and their own realities, they only address part of the migration. So governance is fragmented and there is no uh, comprehensive vision. And this is where we are lacking political willingness. Let me conclude by pointing to the role of the Commission. The first and most important, and this is why this hearing is fundamental, is of monitoring the situation of human rights of migrants in our region. That is goes in line with one of our main uh, duties. But the second one is to contribute to the development of the international law on human rights. Let me take this opportunity to mention a fundamental document drafted by the Rapporteurship on the Rights of Migrants, which are the Inter-American Principles on the Rights of All People in Mobility in 2019, which is one, uh, which is a fundamental tool for us. It's an instrument, uh, a state-of-the-art instrument that um, that addresses the current status of migrants rights, but it's not enough to have adopted this document in 2019. This is found in our website, but it's also very important to uh, share these principles to all stakeholders. We have taken note of all the processes, ongoing processes, for example, the process of the end of this year on the revision of the plan of refugees, also the upcoming conference to celebrate the uh, Cartagena uh, Declaration. There are several spaces where the Commission is available to share these uh, standards. Let me conclude by saying this. The Commission is at the moment uh, drafting a, a regional report on migration from Central America to, uh, to Mexico and the United States, and we will be uh, sharing many of the things that you have uh, underscored here. And second, I think um, Soledad will say this in further detail, but it's important to mention the report on economic, social, and cultural rights of migrants. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Commissioner Hernandez. I now invite Commissioner Strado Vallon to make his interventions. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Y... Thank you very much, Madam President. I would like to be very concrete. I want to repeat um, our thank you to international organizations, civil society organizations, and the representative of the United Nations for the comments that you have brought to this hearing, which are very important for our work. And I will be referring to the challenges. And among the challenges, I want to pick up on something that was mentioned before, which is how, as the Commission, we can make visible the causes that are creating massive exodus of such a magnitude and also a mobility in the region. I am rapporteur, country rapporteur for Haiti and for Cuba, and there has been an unprecedented exodus of persons due to a political crisis, for a lack of democracy, for an economic crisis, and let alone what is happening in Venezuela. And alongside that, there is the economic and political instability in the region. And so these are some of the causes which the Commission, in its holistic view, is mentioning and is making visible. It's important to do this because the countries are overflown with caravans of millions of migrants and there are no possible infrastructure to to receive them or to, to welcome them. There are no physical infrastructures nor resources. So there's an enormous challenge as to how to face those huge caravans of migrants, most of them or many of them uh, with children, unaccompanied children who are uh, going through the Darien route or going through very dangerous 
part. So the voice of the commission must be very powerful in that sense. And I believe that the comments that you have made here are very important for us to add to our work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, my brother, Ralon. Um, I now invite the special rapporteur. Oh, I'm sorry. I see that our executive secretary did come. Do you wish to make a comment, um, executive secretary? Please keep an eye on the clock. We need to hear from the special rapporteur. Thank you. Gracias, Presidenta. Buenos días. Buenos días a todas las partes. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all participants of this hearing. It's a luxury, actually, to have a hearing with such quality of details, with such an orderly view of the region. I would only like to pose a question. If you have time to respond this at this moment, it's OK. Otherwise, we can respond this in our bilateral conversation. Have you identified best practices in sub-regional relationships between the countries beyond concrete uh, decisions at very specific moments. Are there any best practi practices that have been systematized that can help us to, to work on this? Also, with a view of the technical cooperation of the Commission to look at those best practices, to replicate them or to comment or to share them with other states. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much, Executive Secretary. Now, uh, Sol Soledad Garcia Munoz, please, uh, Special Rapporteur. I, I invite you now to speak. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. Buenos días a todas y a todos. Good morning, everyone. It's truly a pleasure for me to take part of this hearing with the Commission. As it was pointed out by Commissioner uh, Rapporteur for Human Mobility, Commissioner Hernandez, we are about to finalize a report on poverty, inequality, and climate change in Central America and Mexico in the context of human mobility. Also, with the, uh, attack, excuse with the me, excuse purpose me, Soledad. of- Excuse me, Soledad, I have to give you a bit of extra time. I know you will be concise, um, but you do have some extra time. Thank you. I will be very, very brief. Only I wanted to ask you if you have any recommendations or comments with regard to, to this that we have discussed in the hearing, the causes, the reasons of, of this uh, situation and how these processes can contribute to analyzing the causes in what has to do with the DESCA rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your understanding, Solidad. Unfortunately, it would have been good to hear you in greater detail, but as usual, time. Um, I, we, I will not make any comments to myself at this time, um, because this is the first meeting of the day, so we are really in a crunch as far as time goes. Now, additional comments by the participants. This is as a group. The civil society has seven minutes and the international organizations also have seven minutes and that's it. So please keep your eyes on the clock. Go to it, civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. From Amnesty International, we want to request the Inter-American Commission, in particular, given the news given by Commissioner Jornal Hernandez, as regards the report. So in that sense, we would like to, in this report and the next reports to be drafted by the Inter-American Commission on the issue of refugees and asylum seekers, we would request uh, the commission to uh, ask the, state to, the states to remember their obligation with a person so that they can have access to territory and, and, and asylum status without being uh, rejected in, in the borders. Also, we request the Inter-American Commission to uh, ask the states that in any migration policies are uh, designed in line with in protection, international protection needs of these people 
uh, with regard to a cooperation between states to res to reserve the spaces of protection. That was all on my part. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in response with the question by uh, Mrs. Tanya, as an example of good practices, maybe we can mention the experience of uh, South America in the framework of the Mercosur uh, agreement as we have said and we will send uh, further information in via writing this is a regional cooperation experience that allows the population within the region to this to move with uh, from state to state and to access regularity and um, territories in a regular manner we believe that is a a good model to uh, replicate or to review as a best practice and we would like to underscore this as an example of coordination that has been in place for 20 years that is unfortunately threatened by the progress of regressive uh, measures so our recommendation is to pick up on the best practices of the mercosur system and we will send you further information uh, soon thank you To add a further comment, we believe that it's important to say that the Los Angeles Declaration and the next efforts require uh, transparent information where we see how these uh, best practices uh, are being implemented. So in that sense, we are concerned about the fact that sometimes the principle of shared responsibilities and differentiated responsibilities is translated into uh, concrete numbers of people who will be received in a given country with a lack of clear information and they restrict the access to international protection anyone else yes i would just like to quickly add i mean in trinidad and tobago the context is quite different which is which is what i wanted to emphasize here at this presentation the government is not sensitive you know to or it says international obligations um however i would like to urge the commission uh to find ways to engage more with the government of trinidad and tobago to find ways to encourage the government of trinidad and tobago to sign on to the la declaration um and also um there is a in 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 terms of regional mechanisms or regional approach and in terms of responsibility sharing, there are models uh, that were uh, implemented in Eastern Europe that might uh, uh, might work in Trinidad and Tobago in the in the Caribbean region, uh, humanitarian transfer programs. Um, so that's something I could I can share more details on uh, in my follow up submission, and it might might work in Trinidad and Tobago because we 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 cannot do it alone. We're a very small country, and it's overwhelming, and we're seeing as a consequence con consequence of that too many human rights violations. Thank you very much. Next. Thank you very much. I will also add to what my colleague said that the migration policies and the lack of information related to that created a, a, a difficult scenario that exposes people to further risks. For example, what was mentioned in the mobility centers uh, or the detention, the extended detention in inhuman conditions generate anguish between people. So within this context, the access to truthful, updated and clear information about policies and how to seek and receive assistance is vital to facilitate the decision making processes. Thank you. Yes, very quickly. Next. <laughs> Maria, are you speaking? Yes, no, thank you very much, Madam President. I, I thought it was just the, the, the civil society. Oh, so thank I you very much. Pardon, I, that my fault, my fault, my fault. I thought I just saw your hand up and that's this. And then, Denise, could you put your hand down, please? Um, no, no more from a civil society. That's it. Okay, then we move to um, human rights international uh, um, organizations. So, 
Where have you gone, Christina? Yes. Yes, Christina, you, you wanted to speak. Did you? Who was it you wanted to speak just now? I've lost them. Yes, Madam Chair, this is My from eyes the... are not good, so I tend to not see what's going on too much. Yes, yes. please go on. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and my apologies for having been over time in my previous presentation. Um, just very quickly from the UNHCR, just maybe perhaps just to go into two areas that I think is very key. Our cooperation with the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, with which we have an agreement, is crucial to us. So I think one of the areas that we will really um, join the efforts from the other participants today is about following up the implementation of the Inter-American principles on human mobility. I think that's very key. I think one of the reports that is going to be coming out from the Central America will be specifically key in quanto advocacy, key messages for the governments, and particular on the way to the preparations for the uh, Global uh, Refugee Forum in 2023. And then, of course, we will continue to cooperate with the Commission in the uh, preparations for the anniversary of the, of the Cartagena Declaration. But I think evidence and advocacy could be very key um, in, in looking at what will be the messages to be given to the international organizations, the civil society, to the states, and actors like the development actors or the international financial institutions and the private sector. I think that's for us uh, very key. Secondly, I think it's important perhaps to reflect upon the 75th anniversary of the human uh, or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I think our colleagues from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights have already alluded to that. I think it's a key instrument that I think we should be able to utilize that as an advocacy message for the country and the states and to remind them of the obligations uh, and that effect. I think it's very important and particularly also looking at the um, how the states are actually complementing and also implementing the obligations under international law and the regional standards on protection when it comes to persons of concern to UNHCR. So I think that framework can I think be another useful tool when it comes to the implementation of the inter-American standards of human rights and international standards. And, and the last thing is about what will be the areas in which UNESCO would actually uh, be able to assist together collaboratively with you. I think for us, it's very important to continue working on the, on the strengthening of the asylum system, as well as other legal stay arrangements with protection standards, as well as the um, complementary um, admission, pathways of admission to, to states, as well as, for instance, it has been mentioned, looking about the stabilization of local communities and the persons which are actually displaced, as well as the fighting against disinformation or disinformation.